project, let me know. Okay, we're going to look at a couple of details more in the buried mirror, and then I want to show you some images of the New World Baroque and talk about some of the particular artists, architects, sculptors that uh, Fuentes is so high on, in, especially in his chapter 9, The Baroque Culture of the New World. That's an interest of mine in particular, and I think if anyone goes to Latin America in almost any part, maybe not so much the southern cone, but certainly Mesoamerica, the Andean region, Venezuela, Brazil, you'll see the Baroque. So we're going to spend some time on that today. But look for, uh, for a moment at the bottom of one, page 157. I am interested, as I said, in the relationship of Spain and Portugal. They're both on the Iberian Peninsula. They have a long history of uh, unfriendly and then later more friendly relationships. But here you'll see what's going on. The Pope decides to divide up the Western Hemisphere and give part of it to Portugal and part of it to Spain. It's just amazing how Europe, once it got on to this conquest, this empire idea, started to think of the whole world as theirs. And it was just a question of who got which bits. And so this Treaty of Tordesillas influences completely the nature of the boundaries of Brazil and the rest of Latin America that is Spanish, the rest of, I should say, Hispanic America. Let's just read it together. The legitimacy of the Spanish-American Empire was based not only on the rights of conquest, but on nothing less than a series of papal bulls. Those are official announcements, pronouncements by the Pope papal bulls dividing the colonial world between Spain and Portugal. It occurs to the Pope to just divide the thing up between two countries. Wow. Protected by Ferdinand and very early, two years after 1492, you're going to see. Protected by Ferdinand and Isabella, the Spanish Pope Alexander VI, born Rodrigo Borgia, Borgia, had more or less bought his way into the papacy, and there he devoted many hours to furthering the fortunes of his bastards, Lucretia and Cesare, Cesare Borgia. But he had time left over, notice the ironic, but he had time left over, little, um, sarcastic, I guess, to favor his royal patrons. Through the Treaty of Tordesillas, 1494, Alexander VI issued a bull that drew a line from the north to the south pole, 370 leagues west of the Azores, those islands in the Atlantic off the coast of Spain, giving Portugal all lands to the east from Brazil to India, and Spain all lands to the west from the Caribbean <coughs> to the Pacific. Then you'll remember that the <laughs> Fuentes goes on and says, well, you know, that's fine for Spain and Portugal, but what about France? What about Holland? These are aspiring imperial powers, too. And he goes on to talk about that. He goes on to talk about England in the next paragraph. Queen Elizabeth says, oh, fine, that's not going to work. All the seas and the air belong to everybody, therefore they belong to me, she says. And then we hear about piracy and so forth. So Fuentes zips over that part of his story, and uh, yet I wanted to point it out to you because of the incredibly long-lasting, to this day, um, division of the Spanish and Portuguese colonies, now Brazil, and of course to the, to the west, Peru, Ecuador, Chile and so forth. So anyway, just that a little, a little detail. There is another place which I've marked on your outline where he's concerned with the relationship between Portugal and Spain. For 60 years, Port Spain rules Portugal. It incorporates it under Charles V um, and makes it, although slightly later too, under Philip II, his son, uh, m making Portugal a part of, of uh, Spain, of the Spanish regime. Portugal fights that off in something like 1640. I'll have to look that up for sure. And to this day in Lisbon, there's a big avenue speaking of the glories of the, the restoration, the restoration of the monarchy in, in Portugal. So I just thought I wanted that to be pointed out to you. OK, now what I want to do is look at the chapter, which I love, the chapter 9. I love all of these chapters. They tell us so much. But let's look at um, chapter nine. I want to look, just show you some of the work of the artists and architects he mentions. If you would go to, it's the very beginning of page 194, we have uh, a picture 
to uh, before the chapter begins of the Baroque facade of the Church of San Lorenzo Potosi, Bolivia, attributed to Jose Condori, 1728. So we're already in the 18th century here. In Europe, the Baroque is the 17th century, but it extends well into the 18th century in uh, Latin America and really into the to the end of the, of the 18th century. In the 19th, then, in comes the neoclassical style. Sometimes the Baroque is removed from the interiors of churches, so you'll see a Baroque church in Latin America today with a, a Baroque faca facade, and then you walk in and it's neoclassical inside because the styles changed, and that's a whole long story, too, why they changed. But think of our nation. Think of Washington, D.C. Think of the Capitol. Think of the Washington, the Lincoln and the Jefferson memorials. They're neoclassical. They're 19th century. The U.S. doesn't have a Baroque period because we become a nation much after the Baroque period, really. Think of Jefferson, Ben Franklin. Those are men of the Enlightenment. The Baroque is the, the century before. It's the Catholic art. It's the art of monarchy, of empire. But what's interesting and why Fuentes celebrates it, you know, why would he celebrate a Spanish art that's an oppressive art, an imperial art, an art imposed on indigenous color, why, culture, why would he celebrate that? Because he says that is what we became. We became the New World Baroque. The art of conquest became the art of counter-conquest. We Indo-Ibero, Afro-Americans, put our stamp on the European style and what we've got is something that's ours. So there's a lot of polemicizing going on here if you want, but when you look at that facade, the picture in our book on page 194, and I'm going to show you bigger pictures of the facade in a minute, you'll see that it isn't like Europe. Here we have a kind of archangel with his drawers, uh, his little uh, skirt, uh, pantaloon kind of thing, <laughs> highly, highly decorated and what Look on either side, and I, here I can show you another pillar, but just on our, in our book, if you don't have it, look, look on, please. Um, look above, it's like the level of the arch. You're going to see on either pilaster, those are columns, but they're not really weight-bearing columns, so that we, they're kind of st stuck to the wall, which is what you call a column that's stuck to the wall as a decorative thing. They're pilasters. Look at those funny little fellows. Or are they women? They're little angels. They seem to have musical instruments. This is what is specifically fabulous about this church, which I've never laid eyes on and I intend to one of these days. Let me show you now on my uh, computer if we can switch to that. Thank you. Um, this is the whole facade. The picture you have is going to come into focus here in a minute. The, the picture we have in our book is here, of course, the upper cuerpo, as they say, the upper story of the facade. And, but, and what I'm going to show, see, up here are the details I'm talking about. You can't even see them in this, though if we zoomed in, maybe we could see them a bit. But I'm going to talk to you about these figures here on either side. And then let's see, ones here on either side. These become, and now let me just go to the details there. That's one of these figures. It's going to come into focus in a minute. There you go. Notice the way the decoration is handled. These are blocks of sculpted stone that are put into place like a mosaic. It feels very different from other kinds of Baroque. It's a, what we call folk Baroque or naive Baroque. Um, the Baroque is characterized by being busy often. There's this phrase about a horror of a vacuum. The Baroque has a horror of a vacuum, so all spaces are filled. But here our interest is in this figure. A famous art historian, 1936, when the New World Baroque is starting to be appreciated, instead of saying, oh, that's just the art of our conquerors, but we got independent in 18 something or other, 1821 in the case of Mexico, or 1810, depending on how we count. Um, and now there's a taking, a, a, a retaking stock, if you want, or taking stock of this art form. And the indigenous or the naive, the folk elements become very important because what do we, and I should have a European example here to show you, but there's something called caryatids, often women's torsos holding up the next level, a cornice or something like that. 
something sticking out. And so this art historian in Argentine actually named Angel Guido, if anybody's interested in him, I can give you his text. He says, you know what we have here? We don't have caryatids, we have indiatids, indiatides. We have, we have something that is an indigenous figure. So there's a gloss on the, on the European way of doing things, and it's ours. This is how we do it here. So it becomes, instead of something that's kind of less and lesser and poorer than the European, it becomes something better because it is syncretic. So you'll remember that Fuentes, to so that's the other picture I have. Now I have someplace else, a whole facade, and I should have looked at, I'm not going to start looking at for it now, but just go back here a minute. What I, Maybe I'll find it, you never know, but um, let me just see if I can get back to this. Front. This is an indented piece, an indented arch on a bigger flat facade. So the, the building structure is super simple, rectangular, but then there's this explosion of activity, of figures, of de decoration in an indented doorway. That's, that's monumental. I mean, it's, it's huge. But that's typical of the New World Baroque. Whereas if you go to Rome and you see the Roman Baroque, which is where the Baroque starts in the 17th century, Borromini and Bernini are the two great architects. You'll see curving facades. You'll see buildings that are set into small spaces in a city. There's a different feel with relationship to the exterior. Side. Yeah, Amanda's had her hand up here. Sorry, Amanda. I've no, no, it was just, um, I had a question I sent to you. Would you? Yeah. Oh. And it was about art, but not in this period. It was the original one on page 100, and I asked you, it seemed Egyptian, almost like a hieroglyph. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. Is there some kind of connection with the, you know, the pyramids and the hieroglyphs? I mean, yeah. Or yeah. not? <laughs> yeah. Um, and you know what? This is such an interesting question. Amanda emailed me and I said, ask me this question because it's so interesting. The, because she's finding, and it's, I think it's there to be found, similarities with indigenous art and Egyptian art, including the structures of pyramids and so forth. But let's, let's hold off on that for now and f keep going on this Baroque thing. And then I'll say a couple words about the relationship of Egypt to indigenous America. As far as anybody knows, there is none. There are coincidences, however, in the geometries, in the pyramids, and so forth. So it's a question that we'll have to look into more. But one thing I do know, and but no, let's go. Let's keep on going here because I was going to direct you right to 186. We will get to this question because I want you to think about the visual. Uh, styles, if you want, and the visual forms of expression of indigenous art as well. What we call art, in indigenous ceremonial representation is what it was for the indigenous peoples. But look what, I don't know if any of you would have given um, Condori uh, as an example on that last question on the quiz or not, but um, he would have been a good one. We get a whole paragraph on him, and after this 1936 essay by the Argentine art historian, he becomes one of the arbiters of this counter conquest, this notion of the New World Baroque as an answer back to Europe, saying, You're not, We're not you, we're us. We're different, we're a mix of cultures, and so let, let, let's celebrate that. Look what he says about this artist. It'd be fascinating, and it's only this church that he's known for, though there are some pieces of furniture that are thought to be his, but this is a very mysterious figure. In the Indian quarter of the great mining capital of Potosi, hearsay has it, there once lived an orphaned Indian from the tropical lowlands of the Chaco. According to myth, he went by the name of Jose Condori, or Condori. And in Potosi, he learned to work wood in the crafts of inlaying and furniture building. By 1728, the self-taught Indian architect was constructing, constructing the magnificent churches of Potosi, surely the greatest il illustration of the meaning of the Baroque in Latin America. Now that's a big statement the greatest illustration of the meaning of the Baroque. The meaning of the Baroque is a mixture of styles and cultures that ends up being something wildly and wonderfully itself. Among the angels and vines of the facade of San Lorenzo, an Indian princess appears and all the symbols of the defeated Incan culture are given a new lease on life. 
The Indian half moon disturbs the traditional serenity of the Corinthian vine. We'll see if we can see that the Indian half moon and the Corinthian vine. I suppose he's talking about this. These are the Corinthian vines. So you can figure out where, where it is he's talking about. And it may be that on the flat sides of either side of this doorway is a sun and a moon. That often happens in Latin American Baroque as well. The half moon, the Corinthian vine. American jungle leaves and Mediterranean clover intertwine. That would seem to be here, this clover leaf figure. The sirens of Ulysses play the Peruvian guitar. And the flora, fauna, music, and even the sun of the ancient Indian world are forcefully asserted. We looked at the Peruvian Baroque earlier in the semester and do uh, go back to that. It's on your website, I believe, on week, in week three. This site I'm going to show you in a minute, not this one, but I'm going to put these up on our website, uh, is on week eight, the New World Baroque. Finish this paragraph, there shall be no European culture in the New World unless all of these our native symbols are admitted on an equal footing. That's easy for the 20th century writer to say. It was a long-term process of transculturation in the New World before indigenous uh, symbols and African symbols were given equal footing. They were there because the, the craftspeople were Indians and later were Afro-Portuguese more than anything, because that's where I want to go now, is to the next big example, and I put it right down on your, I put it on your outline, or my outline, it's pages 201 and 202. This is Alexadinho. My Portuguese isn't great, but it's more like a Spanish pronunciation of it. But it starts on the top of 201, and I have just a couple of his of his sculptures, but were given on the following page. Two examples. Here's one up on the uh, screen. This is the prophet Daniel. But first of all, let's turn this around and look at the ways in which he talk, Fuentes talks about this figure. Fascinating figure. Alexadinho doesn't mean little Alexander, <laughs> as it, you might think it would. It means the little cripple. He had leprosy. It's a fabulously interesting story. Actually, I want to start at the very top of the page, no, the very bottom of 200, where he starts to talk about the mix of African and European cultures in the New World. So far, we've been talking about European and indigenous or Indian mixtures. It's the paragraph that starts at the bottom of 200 that out of this suffering a culture could be both continued and reborn in contact with the previous cultures of the new world is in itself a proof of these people's will to survive, not to be defeated by suffering or even by justified rancor. And like the culture of the Indians, the black culture of the new world found expression in the Baroque. In the same way that a Spanish-American Baroque came into being from Tonantzintla in Mexico to Potosí in Upper Peru, we just saw Tonantzintla at the end of last time, to Potosí, which we've just seen now in Upper Peru. Bolivia didn't used to be a country, it used to be called Alto Peru, High Peru, during the colonial period. Through the encounter of Indian and European, so the fusion of black and Portuguese created one of the greatest monuments of the New World, the Afro-Portuguese Baroque of Minas Gerais in Brazil, the most opulent gold-producing region of the world in the 18th century. There, the mulatto Fra Antonio Francisco Lisboa, known as Aleixadinho, wrought what many consider the culmination of the American Baroque. So both of these guys are on pinnacles, Condordi in, in <laughs> Bolivia, and Alexadinho in Brazil. The son of a black slave woman and a white Portuguese architect, Alexadinho was shunned by both parents in the world. The young man suffered from leprosy. So instead of seeking the society of men and women, he joined a Baroque society of stone. He's referring to the statues. The 12 statues of the prophets he carved in the staircase leading to the church of the good child Jesus, Jesus in Congo, 
Congonhas do Campo, sorry, my Portuguese is horrible, reject the symmetry of classical sculptures. You're seeing Daniel, the prophet Daniel here. I'm going to show you a close-up of the prophet Hosea in one minute when my, you see these visionaries that are looking out and they're huge statues and 12 of them lead up the stairs to a church that he also designed. And I'm going to show you some pictures, I hope, of that as well. In con okay. Like Bernini's Italian figures, Bernini the great sculptor of the, the uh, ecstasy of Saint Teresa and so forth, we'll see it in a minute. Like Bernini's Italian figures, but how absolutely remote from them geographically, these are three-dimensional moving statues rushing down toward the spectator. They are rebellious statues twisted in mystical anguish and human anger. And then I'm very interested in the paragraph that follows where he talks about the roundness of the Baroque. If you think of the Capitol in Washington, D.C., what you're going to think of is vertical lines. You're going to think of all those columns. Well, there's the dome up there that's round, but basically the neoclassical is like this. Think of the Parthenon. That's the classical. It's doing, 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 doing. So it's, it's gridded. But the Baroque has much more interest in sinuous lines, in the, the vines, let's say, that twist and intertwine, because everything is connected to everything. So, in style, if you study the Baroque, you'll, you'll see that, that there's a real desire for everything to be hooked onto the next. So one thing will kind of grow out of another thing, um, whether it's, a, geo whether it's a, a stylistic detail or whether it's a figure. So anyway, this business of the roundness of the Baroque, the middle of page 201, interests me. The roundness of the Baroque, its refusal to grant anyone or anything a privileged point of view, its assertion of perpetual change, its conflict between the ordered world of the few and the disordered world of the many were rendered by this mulatto architect in the church of Our Lady of the Pillar in Oro Preto, literally black gold, Brazil. I'm not sure I've got a picture of that church, but I just thought I'd point out that roundness. Again, it's easy for a 20th century revisionist historian to say that. There was something about the Baroque that was imperial, that was saying, okay, you guys, you've got to all be Catholic and you ought to all think like the imposers of the Baroque. The Baroque was a vehicle of empire, of monarchy, of, of Catholicism. But as I said, now in the middle of the 20th century and on through now uh, currently, the, the, the New World Baroque gets recodified as a statement of independence rather than of subjugation. So that's what he's doing here. And this roundness of the Baroque suggests its inclusiveness, its all the things that uh, we've just read. So that I wanted to point out. You go to the last paragraph of this section and you'll see one more time the homenaje, the homage to this roundness, let's say. Working at night, surrounded by sleep, perhaps Alexandrino gave a body to the dreams of his fellow men and women. He had no other way of speaking to them except through the silence of stone. As it shaped itself, however, this new culture of the Americas, this Indo-Afro-Iberian culture, demanded a voice, and it found it in the greatest poet of colonial America. We're not going to go to Sor Juana Inés de la Cruz. We have a web paper up that's almost finished <laughs> on Sor Juana that, that you'll be able to see and are able to see on our, our website. So I leave it to you to read about Sor Juana Inés de la Cruz, the Shakespeare of Mexico, and probably the best poet of all of Latin America, at least until Neruda, with whom we also have a web paper or two on. But let's, let's go now to the New World Baroque that I want to show you on our website. Let's see here. You'll see this is week eight. This is my teaching function here, so it looks a little different from yours. But on week eight, I have put several slideshows. I'm going to show you the one called the New World Baroque today. I want you to know about the European Baroque because it's hard to know what the European Baroque's about if you don't, I mean the New World's about if you don't know what the Old World's about and then this site that I found. I do want you to pay attention to Baroque art, <coughs> architecture, and indeed literature. Sor Juana is high Baroque, so do read. We're not reading her, we're reading about her in Fuentes. 
But this chapter 9 I consider to be essential because he's finally gotten to the point where he can say something about Latin America. We've gone through Spain for four chapters, then we moved over to the Ind Indian world, remember, and then we're back to Europe with the Age of Empire and the Siglo de Oro, the Golden Age, which is the one just before this. The century of gold is translated, Siglo de Oro, 17th century Spain and now on to the Baroque culture in the New World. So let me show you this. Um, this is up, this is the one that you'll go to on your website. And I'm just going to show you, this isn't perfect, but um, let me show it to you this way. And just talk to you about some of, of these images. This is an, so, so this is less about Fuentes and more about other kinds of New World Baroque that he doesn't mention in this chapter, which is an awful lot of it. This is an atrial cross. What does that mean? The cross that is in the middle of the front yard of a Baroque church in Mexico. The atrium is not, we've seen this already, the atrium is not what we think of in modern terms, which is an indoor garden, right, with a skylight, often in a big building's lobby, there's an atrium. Now the atrium is the front yard, fenced in of a church and to this day when you go to Mexico and many other places in Latin America if you walk into the churchyard there in the middle is a cross. This is a very particular cross as you will notice it's not the Protestant cross which has no body of Christ on it nor is it the Catholic cross which has the suffering Christ whole body. There is a face here and that's, that's Christ, but what's going on? This is 16th century atrial cross in Mexico, an important iconographic <coughs> revision of European iconography. Here we already have the New World, if not Baroque, at least a New World cross. Why wouldn't there be a body wanted on a cross? Because the colonizing friars are trying to extirpate, that is eradicate, the practice of ritual sacrifice. So how can you say, look, isn't this wonderful, here's our God on a cross, when you're saying to indigenous converts, but don't you, don't you sacrifice anybody for your gods? So Christ is a sacrificial God, if you want, um, but there was, as I say, a huge disjun disjunction, disconnect between an image of a dying man on a cross and what the friars and later the secular clergy were trying to teach indigenous converts. So these are, there are several of them around, quite a few of them around, but if you ever see one of these, say 16th century Mexico, because that's the only place where this um, revision of iconography occurred. This is a particularly famous one, it happens to be in the Basilica of Guadalupe in, in Mexico City, and at first you say where's the face, but then you'll see it's right here, there's the crown of thorns, the beard, and so forth. Lots of the thorns, the instruments of torture, as they're called, or of the passion, are there. The nail, the, cr the ladder, the cock who crew, crowed three times. So what you have in this very interesting revision of iconography, the instruments of torture are here, there's a skull down here. There's plenty going on that is instructive. The Baroque was always a teaching instrument for illiterate converts, people who couldn't read, including some of, of the priests. I mean, literacy was not like we think of it today. So these were all important teaching teaching vehicles, and so you get the instruments of the Passion, uh, the torture of Christ, which is what the Passion, with a capital P, means, if in, in this kind of art historical and indeed theological um, talk. Uh, so you get the instruction going on at the same time you're not getting for indigenous converts a counter message about sacrifice. Today, if you go to Mexico, and again, Colombia will do, I haven't been a lot to Ecuador, nor have I been to Peru, but there's, there is a great favoritism for the body of Christ as a suffering emblem, an emblem of his suffering. And so there's lots of, lots of these, and they're often rather, for, from a North American Anglo position, if that's yours, it happens to be mine, um, at first a little um, gory. Here, the, the Christ of El Rey de Burlas, he's called the Christ mocked. 
uh, has seated all of these moments in his, on his way to the cross or on the cross, always the terrible wounds and blood, often the flayed back behind. And you say, well, why this preference for the physical suffering of Christ? It's absolutely historical, and it has to do with the Counter-Reformation. And this may be more than you want to know about this. But it's not, as is often said, well, people in Latin America are very poor, and therefore they relate to poverty and suffering. There's some of that. But it's not, you don't have to be a poor Latin American to worship a figure such as this. Indeed, quite contrary, they're, they're generally beloved in Semana Santa or Holy Week. These are taken off of the walls, put in the aisles where people touch the wounds and so forth. The Counter-Reformation was battling the, the Reformation, duh. <laughs> the Catholics were battling the, the Protestants. What had the Protestants done about the Eucharist? If you're a Protestant, you know that there's a huge difference between the Catholic Mass and the Protestant Communion. Protestant Communion was decided over time that this was not a moment when the blood of Christ, when the wine is changed into the blood of Christ. It's the wine or grape juice in the tradition I grew up in um, is symbolic. It's not, there's not transubstantiation, which in the Catholic Church means the body and blood of Christ are present during the Mass that the wine is the blood. So what happens is there's a huge amount of emphasis in the 17th and 18th centuries on blood, on the blood of Christ, and the holiness of that blood. So this, the Eucharist, meaning the Mass, is what is, is, what is really at issue here. It's the suffering of Christ, but it's also that the transcendence of suffering by Christ in his blood, because the blood is what is salvific. So, so there, there are theological reasons. Yeah, Julie. Um, on page 144 and 145, uh -huh. as you noted in the um, outline yeah. under father and mother, yeah. they talk about how um, Jesus Christ as a sacrificed God helped unite. Um, the native cultures and the native religion to, um, or help them adapt to Christianity because right. they also believed that the gods sacrificed right. themselves. Yeah, that's a very people. interesting point too. Yes, that this whole issue of sacrificial um, salvation, let's say, sacrifice as a mode of salvation it is a theme in indigenous and especially in Nahua and Maya cultural practice. So yes, make a note of that. We won't go back to 40, 144 and 145, but he's essentially talking about the same kind of syncretic goddess who would be the Virgin of Guadalupe. He comes back to that and gives us a whole list in chapter uh, 9 of the Virgin of um, Copper, La Virgen the caridad del cobre and so forth in, uh, let's see if we can see that. It's, uh, go to 199. This is basically, Julie, what you're, I think, pointing out beyond, beyond the indigenous overlay, let's say, or the, the coincidence of this theme of sacrifice. Um, we, we have this syncretism as well on 199, Christian Yoruba syncretism, it's that paragraph, and then what you get is a long list of goddesses that have, besides the Guadalupe, that have this, this dual function. So thank you for that. And now, let's keep on going here. We're making slow progress. Okay, the New World Baroque is never talked about except, well, let me say not never. Most theorists, certainly Fuentes, talk about the New World Baroque as a mixing of cultures. We've already said this several times. And I wanted to show you the goddess Coatlicue. I've asked you to be responsible for her. She's discussed and her myth is discussed in uh, the chapter that Julie's just pointed to on indigenous belief systems. What we have here is not a head. This is, this is a monstrous figure, really, and it's huge. It's in the Museum of Anthropology in Mexico City in the Aztec section. Uh, you'll remember that she was decapitated if you, I believe that Fuentes
is because she's a goddess, blood sprouts from her neck and the blood turns into facing serpents. Serpents are very important. So here you have the face, the, the profile with the fangs coming out. It looks like a little goatee, but it's the fangs. And on the other side, the profile of another one facing. So these are facing serpent heads with a necklace of hands, a skull, and hearts. This is a reference. To, she's both goddess of death and life. So sacrifice implies, um, Im implies life. Likwe means serpent skirt. Coat is Nahuatl, as we know from Coat Likwe, and also from Quetzal Coatl, the plumed serpent, and then these monstrous feet. Even the bottoms of her feet, she's carved all around. But now look at, I wanted to show you, this isn't exactly New World Baroque, but it's the idea, and this is a modern version of Coat Likwe, painted in 1918 by Saturnino Eran. I believe we have a web paper from some year or other up on him, or maybe we don't. I'm not sure. I have to think about that. But he's definitely this fabulous. He died at age 28, shortly after he. This is a sketch for a mural that never got been, got got painted. Here we have Coat Likwe. My slide cuts off her head, except it's not her. It's the serpent heads. And what do we have superimposed upon the body? The body of Christ. You see it here. Here's the Christ with the, the the red coming out of his knees, out of his wound. But look at how it works. Remember, I said the hands of the necklace are here, and here are Christ's hands dra draped over either side. There's the wound in the hand. You see the other hand here. And we've been given by Saturnino Erran a necklace of Sempasuchil, or marigolds, which are the Day of the Dead flower. If you go to any celebration of the dead, there'll be all sorts of marigolds. That's the first and second of November, and these other flowers. So for me, I love Saturnino's work, and I stick it in here to suggest another syncretic a representation of syncretism, very self-consciously saying, look, this is Mexico. We're indigenous, we're Christian, we're both, and see how the two blend. So I, I, his, his work is quite stunning. Then the Virgin of Guadalupe, whom you've seen, always in this version. She never looks any different. Why? Because her image was imprinted on the apron of Juan Diego, the Indian fellow to whom she appeared in 1531. I state that as a fact, indeed, though I happen myself not particularly to be a believer in, in much, um, <laughs> what, I do, what I do believe in is belief. And I admire belief. And what I know about Mexico is that this is a fact for virtually all Mexicans. There are very few who, even if they aren't practicing Catholics, won't believe in the power of the Virgin of Guadalupe, who appeared, favored the Mexican people. I mean, of course, this is all cultural. If you want, if you, if you want to be cynical, you can say, well, of course, the Spaniards were interested in bringing in the Mexican people. So what happens? They invent this, this virgin that has a darker skin, appears to an Indian fellow, and isn't terrific. In fact, the Catholic Church fought this for a long time. They said, oh, no, that's just idolatry. That's the Indians wanting one more goddess for themselves, inventing one. It really takes until about 1648 for the Virgin of Guadalupe to be accepted by the Catholic hierarchy. So, so it's, it, 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 you can think of it as a kind of Madison Avenue move, but in fact, it seems to be to be far, far more, more profound culturally than, than that. This is actually in the Basilica of Guadalupe where this piece of cloth hangs. You can go and see it. How many have, has anybody done that? It's absolutely fascinating. It's a huge pilgrimage spot. The 12th of December is the feast day of the Virgin of Guadalupe. Indeed, in New York City, there are huge parades and so forth. It's not just Mexico, but millions of people, something like six million people from all over, converge on the Villa, as it's called, de Guadalupe, the Basilica, and um, celebrate her, her um, power. The Mexican flag is draped here in front. Uh, I took that picture in particular because I wanted to show the mixture of her theology and her, her politics. That is, she's very much associated with 
Mexican nationalism. Here's a close-up of the face and hands. And then what happens is there are millions of paintings. And what I love about the ones I'm going to show you is it's a narrative. One, two, three, four. What happens here is that the Virgin goes to Juan Diego. He's called Juan Diego. He's located historically. He was made a saint by Pope John Paul XXII. Is that right? <laughs> the, our last pope who named more saints than all the popes in history. A, a very interesting point. Why? Because the Catholic world needs saints in order that people um, continue to be enthusiastic about, about Catholicism. Juan Diego, it's said, appears, sorry, the Virgin appears to Juan Diego. These are angels holding, saying, look, look, these angels say to him. And here, what does he do? He flees. You're going to see these medallions closer up in a minute. He flees, and then she appears to him again, and she says, go to the bishop. First, she says up here, go to the bishop and tell him that I want a church built here for myself, please. He does. The bishop says, no way. What are you talking about? She, he goes back, and the Virgin says, ah, show these roses, these beautiful roses from Castile that don't bloom here at this time. The bishop will then believe you. And when he goes to the bishop, he unfurls his apron. It's called a tilma. And the roses fall out, but here is the image of the virgin on the cloth. And then there's a whole long story about the cloth is laid on a table, and then the wood on the table has a virgin painted on it that's very, uh, very important and so forth. So what you're getting is a whole different idea of the image. This image as the thing itself. It's like a rabbit foot, a rabbit's foot. It's like a relic. It's something that itself, the material thing, has, has power. One more time, the same set of images. I'm not even pointing out how Baroque all of this is. Notice the horror of a vacuum. Notice the angels here before it was something else. And we get always this, this movement toward the final image, which is the victory of belief. Seeing is believing when the image itself is presented to the, to the uh, archbishop he accepts the idea. Then these scenes, these four scenes, start to take on a life of their own. So we have oftentimes these, these four scenes. Here are the angels saying, look, this is the first one here. He runs away. And then look at, I'll show you the next. Here are the roses from Castile. And then he unfurls the tilma. And there, Bishop Sumaraga, the first archbishop, I guess I should say. Um, kneels in, in reverence. So these are painted in the middle of the 18th century. This is very Baroque. Miguel Cabrera is the great, one of the great Mexican Baroque painters. Now I can overdo this, but it's the third scene where Juan Diego kneels and there are roses involved that gets painted again and again and again. I just have two, two here, but this is that moment sort of between where, where Juan Diego and the Virgin are the closest in touch. It seems, it's also very easy, I think, it got painted by lots of anonymous, I mean, lots of the paintings are anonymous because it's a, a fairly easy structure to paint, I think. But here we have angels up here and God with the Baroque curtains and so forth. Now, look at this one. Look, this is a little metal, like that, a metal on either side. It's, it's been condensed into two, this whole story. But right here is the whole story, and any Mexican who looks at this is going to know that this is the story about the miracle of the Virgin and the miracle of her leaving an image. So it's a double, a double miracle, if you want. We see the roses and so forth. And someone would have worn this around uh, her neck, I suppose. I believe it's about that that side. So we have the image of the Virgin and then the story of the leaving of the image. Now, what do you see here? If you looked at this and you didn't know what we were just talking about, you'd say, oh, that's the, probably the Virgin of Guadalupe. Look at what we've got here. We've got the tilma. Here's the piece of cloth, and here are the roses. So this is a painting that's much more about the story of the appearance and this miracle in Mexico than, than it is just about a particular virgin. Most virgins have certain kinds of stories attached, but not, not to this complicated extent. So I, I think it's a very interesting symbolic representation. Notice there's always one little cherub holding her up. She's on a half moon here or a sliver of a moon. Virgins are often on a sliver of a moon. 
and there's a bunch of discussion as to why that's so, yeah. Um, that's really interesting because it uses natural imagery, which the indigenous religion was very inclusive of um, nature images, yeah. like the sun. I think you could say that. There's also a discussion of um, the, the, the moon in particular with virgins as signaling the, the um, female cycle. And here is a, an immaculate virgin, someone who, so that her physicality is, is we're reminded of the miracle of this immaculate virgin. So especially virgins and moons might be a little more specific than just integrating nature as a general matter, though I, I think there might be something to be said on that line too, yeah. Um, and also the um, Virgin of Guadalupe in particular was um, essential to the Mexico's independence yep. and uniting um, the people under New Spain as their own unique culture. Um, like when Guadalupe Hidalgo shouted, like the yeah, Grito Viva de Dolores, yeah. he said, yeah. like, Viva la Virgen. Um, yeah, no, she's always been very associated with, with Mexican nationalism. Absolutely. Yeah, Cody? Um, I was curious about. No, very good question. No, very common in Spain. There is a Virgin of Guadalupe. There's a place called Guadalupe where the conquistadores went to ask for the protection of the Virgin before coming to the New World. It's a very different image. It doesn't look at all like this Virgin of Guadalupe. But no, there have always been, um, let's say, particular the Virgin of Rosary, let's say. She's always got a, the Christ child here in this arm, and she's always got a rosary here. And oftentimes below, there'll be people in purgatory hoping for the rosary and so forth. Or you can recognize lots of virgins. The Virgin of the Immaculate Conception will always have her hair down, and she'll often be stepping on a snake. So no, the iconography of various types of virgins, it's only one figure, right? The Mother of Christ. But she has so many different apparitions, and often there's a certain iconography connected to it. What the Virgin of Guadalupe is specific and unique about is it's always the very same image because it appeared and there's this whole story about the tilma and so forth. So, so that's a, a very good question. The analog to this singular representation of the Virgin are, are the Russian icons. I don't know if you've looked into the Eastern Orthodox way of representing things, but there was a schism between Rome and the Eastern Orthodox Church, which became Eastern Orthodoxy in part because of the way that the holy host would be represented. And the Western idea was, well, you represent them in different ways, whereas the, the Eastern Orthodox notion is that those images are sacred. They're called icons, and they haven't changed since really, I don't know, the 11th, 12th centuries. And this, there was a big council of Nicaea in 700 that's dealing with this problem of how you represent divinity. Now, why is this a problem? Remember the Old Testament injunction, no graven images. You're not going to have images of God, and you're not going to have images of Christ. And when I was in Sunday school, I learned that's because the cults, besides the Hebrews, had graven images. And you read about it in the Old Testament, you know, the, the calf and so forth that w was worshipped. And that, the Hebrews weren't going to do that because their God was spirit. Their God was disembodied. What happens in the Christian revision of that? God becomes a man. And so there's all this representation of Christ, of course. But the, the issue of how to represent divinity is huge. And I can give you lots of texts on this subject. It's one that, that interests me. But what you have then, as we know in Islam, is that there is no representation of creatures. God is the one who makes creatures. So that Old Testament injunction goes ahead in Islam. So what you have in Islam is calligraphy and fabulous geometric. It's a beautiful art, except for Persian miniatures. Those are, are an exception. But um, basically, in Islamic art, you have no representation of selves or of, of animals, that's God's business. And also in Judaic art, in Jewish art, the Old Testament adjunction against graven images. Why, our God is spirit, our God doesn't have a body, our God is bigger than any single body. It is blasphemy to represent 
divine selves, whereas the Roman Catholic tradition takes it in a very different direction where there's just nothing but beautiful, in my view, many beautiful anyway, um, representations of saints and of the, the biblical narratives and the Holy Family and Christ on the cross and so forth. So that's one more way in which, whereas we think of those bare walls in Massachusetts, the Puritans weren't into this, the Protestants still aren't, and even U.S. Catholicism is not as given over to images as, as Latin American Catholicism. But in Protestant ideal, Martin Luther says, you know, we gotta reform the church. One thing we're, we're gonna reform is all these hierarchies. And you know all those angels and all those popes and all those saints that we're supposed to be worshiping, get rid of the pictures of them because we don't want any part of that anymore. So the Protestant church then becomes very sober over time. There's iconoclasm, the Protestant rebel rebellion goes into churches and tosses pretty things on the fire because that's not the way we're going to think about Christ. We're going to think about Christ as a vertical matter, not as a horizontal matter. That is, it's not about a hierarchy of saints and priests and so forth. It's me and God. It's the single believer. We don't even need a priest in between the believer and, and God. So there's a very different way of thinking about visual representation. Now, let me just zip along here. We've got about three minutes. There's, there's the kind of comma after <laughs> this painting. And then what we get is the Baroque, there's always not enough. It's always more, it's always excessive. So now what we have is a, a subgenre of Virgin of Guadalupe paintings that come up where we see God painting the image. To remind, I, when I say that the Virgin imprinted her image on Juan Diego's tilma, I'm doctrinally incorrect. It's not true. Only God could do that. And so here we're reminded, we have the Trinity here in the middle, God with his, there's a whole subcategory, that is, it's called el taller, the, the workshop, or um, some, something like that, el taller or los talleres meaning God at his paint, with his paintbrush, painting the, the image. We have, of course, Christ, of course, the Holy Spirit, which is the dove. What does Christ have in his hand? A rose. Now we know what that means. And we have the angels holding up the cloth that will eventually go on to Juan Diego's neck, tied with a knot behind it. I could go on about this ribbon of Latin here, but I think I'm running out of time, so let me just show you another. If there's one thing in the Baroque, there are five things, or ten things. Here we have not God the Father, God el, el Divino Pintor, as he's called. It's not Pintor Divino either, but now we have Christ painting the image. Again, the torrent of roses up here in the sky, reminding us of the divinity of the image itself. And then I go to Mexico a lot and I have a little apartment where I stay and I decided one day to go out and take pictures of the Virgin of Guadalupe where you can't walk for a block in Mexico City without seeing some. And so I started with the cab stands, these places, and you're gonna see one here. Every cab stand has a protectress and it's most often the Virgin of Guadalupe. There's a close up of it. Here is another one, another cab stand a block away. With, and on the 12th of December at six o'clock in the morning, if you go to one of these cab stands, you're gonna have a mariachi playing Las Mañanitas, the birthday song, and there's um, tamales and so forth. It's, it's a very, uh, it's, it's a belief system that's, that's very alive in, in Mexico and more and more in the Southwest of the US. And in New York City, a friend of mine is going to, for the parade on the 12th of December. This is my apartment complex, as it happens, with a, uh, with a tile ledge thing, and a little ledge where flowers are placed. Here, a public bench in a park near, nearby, and even in the trees, you see an altar to the Virgin of Guadalupe. So it's a very interesting um, and important cult, I guess I would say, but in the best sense of the word, we now think of cult as a bad thing, but what cult mean is a group that are of like belief. And so the, the Virgin of Guadalupe and the Guadalupana, as it's called generally, is, is uh, very powerful. Okay, I'm gonna let you go. Please catch up with your reading, and next week, I won't see you Thursday, next week we will begin Garcia Marquez's uh, Love and Other Demons. <laughs>